Well, hello and welcome everyone to today's webinar, uh, which is titled From Farm Fields to the Great Lakes, Protecting the Lakes from Agricultural Pollution. I'm Jennifer Caddick, the Alliance for the Great Lakes Vice President for Communications and Engagement, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. This webinar is the fourth in our the Alliance for the Great Lakes series, uh, which is exploring the our federal Great Lakes policy agenda. And obviously today we're digging into the issue of agricultural pollution. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. We're excited to have over 300 people registered for today's event. To reduce background noise, all participant lines will be muted for the duration of the conversation. But we will leave time for your questions and to ask a question at any time, use the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen, not the chat, the questions, uh, and that'll help me wade through and facilitate the questions when we reach that part of the conversation. Also, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the Alliance for the Great Lakes YouTube channel in the next day or so. We have a fantastic panel for today's conversation and our panelists include Todd Brennan, who is a senior policy manager with us here at the Alliance for the Great Lakes, Aviva Glazier, who is director of agriculture policy at the National Wildlife Federation, Jamie Konopaki, who is the Midwest office director at the Environmental Working Group, and Tom Zimnicki, who is a program director with the Michigan Environmental Council. And today's panel will be moderated by Molly Flanagan, who is the Chief Operating Officer and Vice President for Programs at the Alliance for the Great Lakes. For our agenda today, uh, Molly will give us a brief overview of agricultural uh, pollution issues in the Great Lakes region and our federal policy priorities related to agriculture. Then she'll facilitate a conversation between our fantastic panel, and we'll leave a few minutes at the end for your questions from the audience. So with that, I will turn it over to Molly. Molly? Thanks, Jen, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Nutrients are a good thing, right? Yeah, they are, obviously. But in terms of lakes and rivers, you can have too much of a good thing. Nutrient pollution fuels massive toxic algal blooms, and is a significant threat to the Great Lakes region's drinking water, quality of life, and economic well being. Nonpoint sources, specifically agricultural sources, are the largest contributor of phosphorus pollution in Western Lake Erie, driving harmful algal blooms in the lake each year. And in August 2014, nearly half a million people in communities around Western Lake Erie experienced multi-day drinking water bans as a result of toxic algae. Harmful algal blooms are a significant problem in other parts of the Great Lakes as well, including Green Bay, Wisconsin, Saginaw Bay, Michigan, and in the Genesee River in New York. The Alliance for the Great Lakes has five priorities for Congress and the administration, and reducing agricultural pollution so we can stop harmful algal blooms is one of them. And to achieve this, we're asking Congress to provide full funding for Farm Bill conservation programs. And you're gonna hear more about that in just a minute. We want Congress to ensure that federal funding for these Farm Bill conservation programs create measurable water quality improvements. And we want them to fund water quality monitoring and annual reporting so we know what's working to improve water quality. This is a solvable solution. And I'm excited to hear what our panelists have to say about what we can do about it. Aviva, can you start off by telling us a little bit about the Farm Bill and a few of the practices that it pays farmers to implement that improve water quality? Sure. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with the Farm Bill, um, or have heard about it, but don't really fully understand what it is, um, the Farm Bill is a massive bill. Um, it's passed every five years and it includes um, basically policy and funding for every aspect of farms um, and food and agriculture. So everything from commodity payments to crop insurance to research, um, nutrition and, and SNAP is the biggest component of it. And then of course, um, is the conservation title, the conservation programs. So Farm Bill conservation programs are voluntary incentive-based programs. Um, you might've heard of programs like the Environmental Quality Incentives Program or EQIP or Conservation Reserve Program or CRP. Um, and these are programs that enable farmers and ranchers and foresters to adopt conservation practices 
on working lands. And um, the programs do that by providing financial and technical assistance to those farmers ranchers. Um, the Farmville Conservation Title includes a whole suite of programs that, uh, that covers a whole suite of different practices, all of which help farmers and ranchers address things like soil health or water quality or wildlife habitat. Um, and so a few examples of some of the practices that um, are covered under these programs and are incentivized through these programs. Um, I'll just share a few examples. So one is cover crops, and most of you are probably familiar with cover crops, but these are crops that are planted um, at times when the principal or cash crop is not uh, in the ground. So instead of soil left bare, um, you plant cover crops to kind of keep the soil in place, to put nutrients into the soil, and that has significant benefits for soil health and for water quality. Another practice is diverse rotations or conservation crop rotations. Um, so that's growing different crops in a planned rotation. So instead of just having a corn soy or corn cor corn rotation, you add in um, small grains or hay or cover crops into that rotation. Um, and that also has an very important benefits for, um, for nutrient management, for soil health, water quality. And then the last practice I'll just mention is um, conservation cover establishment. You might have heard the phrase, farm the best, save the rest. So the idea here is um, if there are pieces of a field that are very marginal, highly erodible, not particularly productive, um, getting those pieces out of row crop production and instead planting them with conservation cover, grasses, trees, or wetland vegetation. So those are just a few examples. <laughs> Thanks, Aviva. It's really helpful to have that overview. Um, and you, Aviva started to get into this somewhat but Jamie, I'm curious what Environmental Working Group thinks about farm bill programs, why they're important to water quality, and what some of the challenges are. Yeah, um, Aviva did a great, great overview. Thank you for that, Aviva. Um, the farm bill conservation programs are really important. As we know, ag is the agriculture is the biggest source of um, fertilizer nutrient pollution. Um, and the Farm Bill Conservation Programs by far uh, provide the most funding for the types of practices that Aviva was talking about that we all know are necessary um, to address farm nutrient pollution. In, in addition to just providing funding, uh, a lot of critical technical expertise and planning and implementation design of those practices comes through the Farm Bill Conservation Programs. Um, and lastly, I think it's, it's really clear that farmers trust these programs. So one of the big challenges with implementing conservation and addressing nutrient uh, pollution is that we've got to get farmers, in many cases, to work with uh, government agencies on a voluntary basis. And so the, the Farm Bill and the conservation programs and the NRCS offices that implement those programs have a longstanding trusted uh, relationship that really is, is critical to getting into place all the practices that Aviva was talking about. So big source of funding, great source of technical expertise, planning expertise that is, is, is fundamental to getting the actual practices on the ground and then trusted programs from an agency that farmers have worked with for a long time. Um, I think we'll get into the challenges a little bit more. I can, I can go there now if you want, but I think that we were going to talk about that a little, a little bit later. That, yep. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Sure. Um, so now I'm going to turn to both of you uh, as experts in the Farm Bill um, to ask what else you think we need to do to prevent farm runoff. And this could have, this could have nothing to do with the Farm Bill. It could be Clean Water Act related or some brand new program you dream of getting into the farm bill. Um, as experts, we're curious what you think needs to be done. Aviva, do you wanna go first or do you want me to? Sure, I can go. Um, well, I live and breathe farm bill. So that's where, that's where my mind goes for this question. Um, but you know, basically we need to scale up conservation practices even more across the landscape in order to achieve you know, the watershed level results that we wanna see. Um, and so that means increasing funding for conservation programs so that every farmer or rancher or forester who wants to participate can. It also means increasing the available conservation technical assistance, the, you know, that on the ground technical knowledge that Jamie mentioned um, so that you, know, you have folks being able to help those farmers figure out what the best practices are um, for their, to meet their needs and to help, help them with things like conservation planning. And it also means 
thinking about how we can better align um, crop insurance with conservation so that crop insurance makes it as easy as possible for farmers to adopt conservation practices or even you know, eventually incentivizes adopting practices that help to reduce risk while also providing environmental benefits. So thinking you know, holistically um, across all of the incentives that we provide to make it as easy as possible for farmers to participate in these programs and adopt these practices. Yeah, that's great. I definitely agree with all of those recommendations. I think a little bit more uh, broadly in terms of challenges, one of the big ones that we see is transparency. It's really important to protect uh, farmer privacy, but we also need to understand the outcomes, the environmental outcomes that we are achieving through these programs. Um, and so historically, there has been kind of a back and forth over how much we can say about what we're doing, where we're spending dollars, and where we're putting practices on the ground. Um, and I think that we need to lean a little bit more toward the transparency end. And I think that there's great examples, um, some of which Todd will get to later, where we have farmers engaged in watershed projects, uh, where we're focusing on using dollars to quantify outcomes, as opposed to just using dollars for implementation. Um, implementation is key, but we again, we've got to know what we're getting for that implementation in terms of water quality benefits. So transparency, I think, is um, a place where we can do some improvement. Quantifying of outcomes is, is a challenge also, and it's something that kind of is coming up in this larger agricultural greenhouse gas emissions conversation. You'll hear a lot of people talking about carbon sequestration and, and how much carbon sequestration we can get on the landscape. And that's, you know, that, that conversation is very similar to this one in the water quality space. Um, what, what amount of nutrient reduction are we getting for the practices that we're implementing? And we're still quantifying things in very different ways, which leads to uncertainty, you know, feeling like we're comparing apples and oranges in terms of different areas where we're working. So transparency, I would say quantification, um, closely related to quanti quantification tracking long-term, um, how long are practices staying on the ground? And so are we accumulating benefits or are we really putting new practices in and we're still stuck at the same level of benefit because the other practices we paid for have gone away. Um, and then something that I think was also touched on is, is integrating or a holistic approach, which is not just critical across farm bill conservation programs, but I think Todd will touch on this later. It's, it's also critical, I think, that we do a better job of integrating Clean Water Act programs and farm bill programs. Um, in particular, the, the 319 program in the Clean Water Act is dedicated to uh, what the technical term is non-point, but what, what that means is, you know, working with farmers uh, most of the time to achieve water quality goals in the state that can't be achieved unless uh, rural areas and urban areas work together. Um, so I think transparency, quantification, tracking and integration would be my uh, improvement areas. And all of them are, are really closely related to the specific examples that Aviva was discussing. Thanks, Jamie. And yeah, I mean, one of the one of the things that we struggle with is like, how do you scale up those practices that are working enough to make the difference that needs to be made in water quality? So Aviva, you made that point really well. And monitoring and quantifying outcomes, knowing whether we're improving water quality is, is part of our um, priorities, because it really is so critical to know if we're putting money into these programs that we are getting the outcomes that we need in order to help lakes and rivers, while also protecting the need of farmers to have the privacy that, that they deserve. So thank you both for, for starting us off with some of those federal pieces. Tom, I'm gonna move to you. Uh, Michigan is the Great Lakes states. Touched, well, I guess it's just one state. Uh, touching four of the Great Lakes and entirely within the watershed. Michigan produces a wide variety of agricultural products, but corn and soybeans, dairy and livestock dominate in places like Lake Erie and the Saginaw Bay watersheds. How is Michigan doing in its efforts to manage farm pollution into Michigan's water bodies? Yeah, thanks Molly and, and appreciate everybody uh, that's on the line today. It's it's a really impressive list and I see a lot of familiar names on there. So appreciate everybody's time. <clears throat> um, Michigan and yeah, like yeah, Jamie and Aviva did a great job at kind of that federal level. Um, Michigan, like Ohio and Indiana for Lake Erie, was charged with having to develop nutrient reduction plans specifically around phosphorus uh, for the western basin of Lake Erie. Um, as and what are it's called a domestic action plan. Um, I know there's kind of probably varying levels of folks on the, the call here. So 
uh, states had to develop a domestic action plan that was basically this roadmap for how are we going to achieve phosphorus reductions in the basin. Uh, Michigan, and then not dissimilar from, from other states in the area, uh, relied pretty heavily when it relates to agriculture on voluntary programs and voluntary adoption uh, of conservation practices. Uh, there's also a big component within those action plans around point sources and wastewater treatment plants. Um, those uh, have a little are afforded a little bit more regulatory oversight because they are uh, regulated differently than than agriculture. Um, what we have found not only in Michigan, but we see this kind of across the country and in a lot of different watersheds that this this total reliance on voluntary approaches and voluntary programs to achieve the level of phosphorus reductions that we need to see um, just isn't cutting it. Um, we saw this in Chesapeake Bay. We see this throughout the Midwest, um, that that's just not an effective way uh, to go about getting those phosphorus reductions. So um, Michigan is, is kind of in the process of, of continuing to implement that domestic action plan and an accompanying uh, adaptive management plan. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of see how that, how that ends up taking hold. Wait and see. Thanks, yeah. Tom. I understand that your organization, Michigan Environmental Council, is working with some folks in the agricultural community to better address water pollution. Can you tell us about a little bit about that work and why it's important in Michigan? Yeah, I, so uh, Aviva and Jamie hit on a lot of those federal programs. And I think what's important to, to kind of remember is a lot of those programs and a lot of the funding for conservation is really geared towards uh, one type of adopter. So we're still trying to like pump more money to get more farmers to adopt practices. And really as a state and a country, we've, we've done kind of a poor job of, of providing resources and opportunities for farmers that are already very engaged in conservation efforts. And so what we've been doing in Michigan, along with partners in the agribusiness community, as well as uh, some partners on this call, the National Wildlife Federation, MSU, um, that we're really looking at where are their policies and programs and investment opportunities for the state to, to take on that really are trying to get those uh, farmers that are already engaged in conservation, how do we get them to an even better place? I mean, these are folks that have already signaled that they are committed to conservation and committed to implementing uh, new and additional practices. And so we as a state need to make sure that the investments and the policies are in place um, to allow those farmers to continue to excel. So we've been working for the last few years uh, on some of those policy issues and some of those investment issues. Certainly happy to get into more of those details, but uh, I think important to highlight that uh, it's not always this adversarial relationship between traditional environmental groups and the agricultural sector. Um, there are a lot of opportunities for overlap um, and there are a lot of opportunities to kind of get win-wins from both an environmental standpoint, but also on farm economics. Thanks, Tom. And yeah, I love that focus on win-wins and showing that environmental groups can work with the agricultural community to get results. And we're going to hear a little bit more about how that's working at the local level in a couple of minutes. But first, Jamie, Environmental Working Group is working across the nation. And I know you're the Midwest director, so you've got a good handle on all farm things happening across the Midwest. We heard what's going on in Michigan. I'm wondering if you can tell me one example of a Great Lakes state that's doing a good job of addressing farm runoff. Uh, one example is hard. I'll do really quickly a few examples. I think there's three big things that Great Lakes states are, um, are leading on, or Midwestern states are leading on. Um, so one of the things that we see in Minnesota and Wisconsin is state, statewide numeric standards or limits uh, for phosphorus in lakes and rivers. And that's really important because you can do all of this planning and implementation, but it's really hard to set a goal up front to know what you're shooting for if you don't have numeric standards. It's something that EPA has been calling for for like 30 years. Um, but so far, only Minnesota and Wisconsin have passed those statewide phosphorus limits. Um, another really cool thing, I think, is the state funding initiative. So H2O. Ohio is a new one. Minnesota has a clean water fund. Those create hundreds of millions of dollars to supplement um, practices and to take a more uh, state-specific approach to the implementation of practices that we've been talking about. 
And the last thing that I think is important that we were just touching on is encouraging partnerships. So Wisconsin also uh, places a lot of emphasis and has increased funding for farmer-led watershed councils. And a lot of those farmer-led watershed councils are partnering with um, regulatory or regulated, excuse me, entities, so cities and wastewater treatment plants to uh, find the most effective and efficient way to reduce phosphorus that's contributing to algae blooms and other issues. So um, there's a lot of great leaders, a lot of great things going on in all the states. And so um, my hope is that in the near future, we're learning from each other and, and catalyzing progress. But those three areas I think are really impressive in terms of state-led initiatives. Thanks, Jamie. Those are great examples and things that the states can learn from each other potentially to you know, start doing more of. And it's a great segue into uh, some really local work uh, and some more information about partnerships. Todd, the Lower Fox River and Green Bay in Wisconsin provide a compelling local example of different stakeholders working together to address phosphorus pollution. I know the Green Bay Sewerage District, also known as New Water, uh, is working directly with farmers to reduce phosphorus that cause harmful algal blooms in Green Bay. Can you briefly tell us a little bit about how that works? Yeah, so it's a great question and a good segue. As you mentioned, it really started with the numeric nutrient pollution standards that are statewide that Jamie mentioned. Um, so what that means is scientists and organizations like us worked hard to determine what levels of phosphorus, in this case, different types of water bodies, including those in Lake Michigan and Lake Superior, could handle. And then theoretically, sources upstream have to reduce their nutrient loads accordingly. Uh, so it's unique in a way in that you're letting the water dictate water quality needs versus the technical capacity of the polluters, which is the way it kind of is in, in a lot of the other states. So in the case of permitted entities, such as point sources, so these are wastewater treatment facilities like Green Bay uh, and industry, um, and to a degree non-point sources like urban stormwater utilities. So in other words, those with a pipe, they have to reduce to specified levels administered through their Clean Water Act permits. So this in, in total is called the phosphorus rule. So we knew we wouldn't get to water quality, however, in most watersheds because Wisconsin is pretty ag dominant in a lot of these watersheds, uh, especially in Green Bay. So alternative compliance options were developed to allow point sources to consider working in the watershed to reduce pollution and possibly more cost effectively by working with non-point, so primarily agriculture. So it's based on sort of a cost benefit to risk theory that it's, it's a lot more expensive to build treatment and filters and urban spaces. So if you can instead go upstream doing conservation with farmers, you can possibly attain water quality for cheaper, which is better for everybody. Um, and they have several options, but the one that Green Bay chose is, is called the adaptive management option, which basically means they will achieve water quality at their point of compliance, which is basically kind of where their pipe pours into the water body. Um, and that they dump into. And they get 20 years to do so with incremental benchmarks they have to meet along the way. Um, and it doesn't mean the Green Bay Metropolitan Sewer District in this case gets a free pass on their pipes discharge permit. They still ultimately have to bring their water and their pipe into compliance, but they get a longer time to, to work on that. And theoretically, if the water quality from the upstream work is, is super effective, they may get to roll with a less stringent limit on their uh, permit. Um, based on that upstream work being more impactful. So that's kind of roughly how it works. Thanks, Todd. And just as uh, I was saying to Jamie that states can learn from each other about what works, what doesn't work, and, and implement programs that work, it sounds like the same thing is true at the local level. There are probably lots of watersheds that could look at what's happening in the Green Bay watershed and with new water and think of ways that they could cut costs and, and still improve water quality. Um, I also know that there's an agreement between county executives and the Oneida Nation to reduce phosphorus in Green Bay by 30% by 2030. So that seems like a pretty ambitious goal. And I'm wondering if you think it's realistic and how they can make it happen. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you some information. And I'll circle back to that, 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 that the hard point. Um, so in fact, it's that goal is the halfway interim goal to the ultimate goal of achieving a 60% reduction by 2040. And this is based on the Lower Fox River, what's called the total maximum daily load, which is basically just a watershed pollution diet uh, that's been created by the EPA to help specific water bodies tackle a pollution uh, problem. 
And that will that 60 percent theoretically is supposed to attain water quality. That's climate change and extenuating circumstances notwithstanding. Sort of on paper, that's what we need to achieve. So it's a good question that um, we've been uh, that I've been working on as we speak. So, for example, we put together a report to give back to the executives that shows for the last six years, we've received an average of seven and a half million a year for phosphorus reductions across the major implementers and funders. So federal government, state, et cetera, uh, including the United Nations as well. So, however, based on projections we've made, we've also been able to take our nutrient standards and, and apply that with tools um, to estimate how much it would cost over 20 years for agricultural reduction specifically. And that number is about 520 million. So that means a $26 million a year. So we are starting every year from this year at an $18.5 million shortfall. So ostensibly charging future generations if we don't do anything more to bring those costs down via policy or more support investment. So uh, what this means is with that armed with that information, the first step in this process has been making that commitment that they made work. So we incorporated a planning and a governance system that works with the group of elected officials to ostensibly do two things. They represent the largest units of land management to get as close as we can to managing a regional issue at a watershed scale. Most of this country is not built around managing things at watershed scale. So we had to have a homegrown this. Uh, the other thing they offer is they represent Northeastern Wisconsin as a group of elected advocates who have come together to push for that need to support for policy change at the state or regional or federal levels. So the planning entity that we created to bring this to life is co-led by ourselves, the Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance, a watershed group, and the Wisconsin DNR, uh, and, which is the regulating agency and also provides a lot of support and expertise. Uh, so this is facilitated through a steering committee that, that we co-lead and then a stakeholder advisory group, as well as five technical work groups that cover the area. So we both report out to the counties and the tribe, as well as receive some coordination and support funding from them. And ultimately, we will move forward with a plan or a roadmap that we're creating uh, that will be adopted by the counties and the tribe at the government level and hopefully at the state level. And will be overseen by something we're going to create, which is a Northeastern Wisconsin governance body made up of a lot of these players. Um, so basically, to answer your question, is it realistic? Uh, sure, anything is possible. Will it be difficult? Absolutely. Um, but what I think is this model of building from the ground up and then looking for buy-in from the top down has shown itself to be useful. So, for example, large funding entities like the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative run out of the EPA, they're always looking for that local leadership, skin in the game, and buy-in. Well, we've homegrown that, and now we're looking for their buy-in to our governance structure and our solution. So, I, I think we're we're on the right pathway to at least uh, tackling this at a, at a at a comprehensive and collective scale. Thanks, Todd. And one of the things that I'm taking away from from things that all of you said is just how important partnerships are to this work. Whether you're talking about the farm bill, whether you're talking about work at the state level, whether you're talking about work at the local level, um, having stakeholders, government, and agencies involved at the local, state, and federal levels working together and learning from each other to achieve water quality is really critical. And so with that, I'm going to ask my final question before we open, well, before I turn things back to Jen, and I'd like to do a bit of a speed round. I'd like each of you to pick just one thing that you think would have the biggest impact on nutrient pollution from farms in the Great Lakes. What is it for each of you? And I'm gonna start with Aviva. Well, not surprisingly, I'm going to go back to the farm bill. And I think um, the one thing within the farm bill that would have the biggest difference is to double the size of the farm bill conservation title. Um, farm bill conservation programs are routinely oversubscribed currently. There's a wait list to get in them. Um, and farmers aren't able to enroll because there isn't enough money. So um, yes, doubling the farm bill conservation title is a big goal. but the scale of the problem at hand means that we need to be thinking bold and we need to be thinking big. So um, let's double the Farm Bill Conservation title. Awesome, we'd like to join you in, in asking for that. More money is definitely needed. Um, Jamie, how about you? Um, I think more money is definitely needed, but if we're gonna ask for more money, we need to come back to those things that I mentioned, which are transparency, tracking of outcomes and quantification so that we know where we're spending dollars and whether or not things are working and if we need to change course. And I think that transparency tracking 
and quantification need to be improved across the board in the federal farm bill programs and the similar state level programs. Thanks, Jamie. And I can see how those things work together really well. Um, coming down to the state level, uh, Tom, what do you think needs to happen to have the biggest impact? Uh, there, there are so many things that would have a big impact, but one that hasn't been hit on, I, I think we need to start thinking about and treating livestock waste the same way we do with human waste and human sludge. Um, you know, we still apply and, and utilize manure um, the same way that we did 100 plus years ago, where we just kind of sling it onto a field. Um, and given the advancements in technology uh, across the country, um, we need to be implementing some of those treatment technologies within uh, the livestock space to uh, prevent that the runoff occurring from, from those facilities and the application of that waste. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, it seems like we have to treat human waste before we dump it into water bodies. Why don't we have to treat animal waste? Right. Todd, you're going to get the last word, yeah, on this in terms of the speed round, and then I'm going to go back to Jen. Yeah, so pulling from a couple of those and then Tom's and then even some stuff that's mentioned in the chat. I mean, I, like others, I agree. <laughs> if you could just if it could just be one. But um, I think targeted performance programs approaches are really helpful. We've seen this and I kind of gave a little uh, insight into this in Wisconsin um, in a couple of ways. But the idea of uh, developing standards and then rules that are geographically relevant, uh, not necessarily one size fits all. And so that we can find ways for these programs like NRCS or these nutrient demands that are a little bit different in different places um, can be catered to so that you can see that change more quickly and probably be uh, taken up more um, holistically because it means something to those local uh, folks. So the frame for work for this exists at the federal level through the EPA's uh, total maximum daily load program, as I mentioned. Um, but they could be used by federal agencies and states to establish special management. They do that. They, that is an opportunity that's available in Wisconsin to also coordinate resources and create special rules that are specifically relevant to that nutrient issue at a localized level. Uh, you can also do this specifically in areas of acute need. Uh, so in Wisconsin right now, we're going through a process with nitrates, which play quite a role with water quality um, along with phosphorus for groundwater and in specifically in those areas that have sort of highly um, permeable soils. We're trying to create a new standard and then new um, performance standards and then rules around which uh, agriculture can attain. So what you do is you're sort of setting the deck to allow people to be most successful by both focusing incentives, but also giving people guidelines by how which they could, uh, they could do this um, and be set up for better results. And, and and the, the communities that are being impacted would hopefully see those results. Thanks, Todd. And the reason I hesitated over whether you were gonna have the last word is because I was trying to figure out whether I wanted the last word, and of course I do. Um, so I agree with everything that everyone has said. I mean, these are great ideas. And if we were to implement all of them, we would definitely, I think, make huge strides toward addressing uh, water quality issues. One of the things that I've thought about that I think Jamie probably ties to yours, but maybe isn't exactly the same thing is, you know, if we used farm bill conservation dollars, state funding, local efforts to pay farmers for practices, and we're somehow able to tie those to performance. So you don't get funded based on, you know, putting the practice in the ground, you get funded based on improving water quality. And so that's the thing that I think of, but I, I mean, I think we should do, we should do all of these things and we should work together to make them happen. With that, Jen, I'm going to turn it back to you. Yeah, thanks everyone for a great conversation. Um, and we have a lot of questions coming in, so we'll, we'll do what we can to get to several of them. And I'm going to kind of maybe smoosh some of them together. Um, Related to that last point, Molly, about um, and several, this has been a sort of a theme throughout the conversation around, you know, making these programs, make sure as we're paying farmers that we are seeing the clean water outcomes that we want to see. There are a couple of questions about whether or not um, or what 
A, I think first of all, whether or not these programs should shift from being voluntary to regulatory, and B, if there's any conversation about that either at the federal level with the Farm Bill or within some state programs. There's obviously a lot going on um, with the Lake Erie states. So Jamie and Aviva, I'll, I'll put you on the spot first um, for your thoughts on that. Aviva, do you want me to go first this time? I would say there's, there's very little, I would say it's probably fair to say no conversation about making farm bill conservation programs regulatory. It's just not an approach that's um, being discussed at this time. It's very different at the state level. As Todd mentioned, Wisconsin not only has phosphorus uh, standards, they're now working on regulatory nitrate standards. Minnesota similarly has regulatory standards. Um, and I think that these things complement each other again like Todd was saying you know the regulatory standards in Wisconsin are really about setting goals for watershed planning and moving towards um, implementing practice practices on the ground on a farm by farm basis but with the goal of meeting the outcomes that we need you know in the water bodies themselves so I think that, that um, it's moving forward somewhat on <laughs> on parallel tracks at the state and the federal level but they're very complementary um, and I think if things keep moving in this direction that um, the, the the programs at the state level, not the federal level, will um, will be able to see some good progress in terms of getting where we need to go. I think I think that's right. I think um, a lot of the success of the farm bill conservation programs and the strong interest in them has to do with the fact that they are voluntary and incentive based and non regulatory. And so I don't see that changing anytime soon. And I think we'd have a very different um, conservation title if it was not voluntary. Um, I will mention that um, this is not regulatory, but um, you know, a little bit of a different program is the conservation compliance provisions of the Farm Bill, which attach basic soil and wetland conservation provisions to crop insurance premium subsidies. So in exchange for getting those premium subsidies for crop insurance, farmers have to agree to um, not drain wetlands if you have a wetland on your property. And if you have highly erodible soil, have a soil conservation plan in place. Um, and so those very basic provisions have been um, actually responsible for preventing a lot of soil erosion and water quality impacts. Um, so you know there has been some discussion about you know, whether it's time to look at those again and, you know, whether they're as um, strong as they can be. Um, but I think that's as close as you're going to get to um, semi-regulatory. And again, it's not regulatory. It's still voluntary. Mm -hmm. And something that's kind of in the middle, just to build off of, um, is the RCPP program. So that's one of the, the only program in the conservation title where folks are required to try and evaluate um, and put forward outcomes that they'll achieve through their projects. Um, and then report on whether they were able to achieve those on the back end. So that's the, uh, one of the newer Farm Bill conservation programs. Um, and it's also interesting because the, the water uh, practices that are being put in through that program um, are starting to integrate more of that watershed focus as opposed to the individual farmer focus. So that one, one individual program in addition to the conservation compliance programs kind of bridges a little bit of the regulatory voluntary gap. <laughs> Yeah, and Tom and Todd, I don't know if you want to chime in anything briefly from you know the state level, particularly thinking about Western Lake Erie and a lot of the controversy that's been happening around there. Uh, yeah, certainly, certainly at the state level, uh, there is zero appetite uh, for that kind of stuff right now. Um, and so again, like that's a lot of our work and a lot of our focus is trying to find where are there some avenues where we can continue to find and deliver additional conservation practices kind of within the confines that we currently have. Um, there, yeah, there, there's no interest at the state level in Michigan to, to start regulating anybody that isn't already um, under some sort of regulation. And I would guess maybe the, the one thing that you touched on before, Tom, that we didn't touch on in the regulatory voluntary is obviously the, the larger feedlot operations are, are regulated. Um, and there is some room for improvements in those programs, definitely um, the larger feedlot programs in terms of monitoring uh, groundwater and, and surface water runoff there and better integrating, I think, the, the regulated feedlots into the watershed programming that we're seeing. 
Correct. Yeah. No, I, thanks, Jamie. Yeah. Um, it also kind of on that note, it will, I will avoid going down this rabbit hole, but um, that, you know, the, the department in Michigan made some, some small tweaks to that permit to, to better protect uh, water quality in the most recent uh, permit update. Uh, and then that was almost immediately challenged by a large number of, of agricultural groups in the state. So even, even like what I would say are fairly like regular and mundane like updates and, and tweaks to permits are, are being challenged. So the idea of having some sort of like state reg come down on this um, is very far from happening. Similar challenges took place in Wisconsin also yeah. just to round up the conversation. We also have a, a number of questions uh, about manure, always a fun topic. Uh, and so Tom, I'm gonna kind of start with you because you brought this up as your one thing um, in the speed round there. And, and there's some questions about like what the opportunities are for those major uh, feedlot operations that have a lot of livestock, whatever kind of animal it is and managing all of that manure. Um, and, you know, as you mentioned, uh, I think it was you, uh, you know, that, that cities and municipalities have to treat the human sewage um, but there are very different rules and regulations for that farm managing that farm manure. Um, what are your thoughts on on opportunities forward to address that problem? And sort of is 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 there an interest or a, a potential to shift some of that responsibility um, onto those agricultural producers to manage that waste? Yeah, I I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing that when it's like all right, time to talk about manure, we'll <laughs> go over to Tom. Um, the, but I. Uh, yeah, so there were there were a couple of comments in the chat, and I was going to respond to one of them. There was a question about uh, anaerobic digestion as a way to deal with with livestock waste. Certainly, ads are are coming online more and more frequently. Those you know can have and do have a benefit when it comes to reducing E. coli and other pathogen uh, concentrations within the waste stream. Um, it also helps kind of. Uh, separate out the parts of manure. And, and there are people on the call that are going to object to that wording, but I'm trying to kind of keep it in the middle. So, so it makes the, the manure a little bit more manageable because it kind of changes the form of manure from pre-digestion to, to afterwards. Um, the problem with that being is that digesters on their own don't do anything to reduce uh, nutrient loading. And so you still have a, a phosphorus laden product at the end of this. And so there is a need to do kind of additional treatment and additional separation of those uh, nutrient components after the fact to again, get them into a more manageable form that we can move to other parts of the state, other parts of the watershed where that fertilizer and where those nutrients are needed. The problem that you're seeing right now is, is uh, manure is typically very wet and heavy, especially especially dairy manure, um, swine to some degree. Um, but the, and so there's there's a limit to where farms are going to take that, how far they're going to transport it to apply it, and so often it gets kind of applied within that same few mile radius of the farm, and so over time this creates this like super saturated uh, condition, which then causes nutrient leaching or, or nutrient transport into the water. So, so I think it's, it's, there are a couple different technologies that I guess can get us there. Uh, but the important thing is to get it down into components where we can then move it to areas where the risk of runoff and the risk of nutrient loss is less. If I could just, and another big component of these technological engineering fixes is the cost. Yeah. Digesters are really expensive, um, whether or not they're hooked up to energy systems or not. And, you know, one of the things we've been digging into is, is the economics, how, how have these digesters been paid for, subsidized? You know, a lot of them, there have been bankruptcies and then transfers of things. So uh, the economics of paying for that versus taking a different approach, um, it's a really important piece that we can't leave out. You know? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. And, and, and Jen, just one more thing on that. Like, I think that's an opportunity. Certainly in Michigan, there are a lot of digesters coming online for the energy portion of it. Um, there are credits and money to be made in the state and nationally to, to sell those credits. Um, so, so like as a state, do we start looking at investments on, okay, we're already, they're already putting in an AD. 
how can we put in additional treatment on the end of that AD to further uh, kind of improve the water quality outcome that's going to come from that manure. So I, I think there are ways that, that we can look at that where, yeah, they're expensive, um, people are doing them. So is there is there a role for the states to be kind of furthering that water quality objective? Yeah, and Genevieve, don't mind, I'll just chime in that, you know, for there's some, some knowledge going on in the chat and, and the answers, especially, as well as people who maybe are wondering, you know, we talk about pollution being regulated for CAFOs, for example, but the, the stuff, the manure they then spread on the landscape is, for the most part, not regulated. And so that's the issue. And you have to ask questions, as Tom pointed, whether some of that land can carry it can carry that nutrient load and so how we can transform it. So to so the farmers too, they look at manure at this point as a liability, that old day regenerative ag where they have just enough manure, they can put it back on in the land and it's all kind of a closed system. You know, at some point we have too much manure and so we have to figure out a way to uh, both capture, manage, and then uh, to a degree maybe export it. So um, it's, a, it's a difficult situation, especially in areas where you have more consolidation, larger farms forming, and CAFOs moving into watersheds that didn't have it um, as they sort of move around the country. And so it is definitely an issue that's growing and it's growing and it's been here and it's growing in the Great Lakes as an issue that needs attention. So it's a good, good point, good question. Just to give an idea of the scale, we're starting to go through and look at the growth of CAFOs in different areas. We've, we've completed the assessment for Iowa, which is obviously a little south of where we're talking about now, but CAFOs in Iowa now produce about 70 times as much manure um, as humans in that state. So just when we're talking about building this treatment and treating it like we treat human waste, each one of these CAFOs um, produces the same amount of waste as a town of about 25,000 people. That is a lot of new towns, a lot of new wastewater treatment. Um, and um, Iowa certainly has the most, but it, to Todd's point, these, these are growing and expanding. And so I think that's a helpful number. You know, each one of these, just think about as another small to medium sized city um, in one of these Midwestern states. So it's really important to do the assessment on the front end and the evaluation of the capacity of the landscape to hold it in case we just can't afford to build all of this treatment that we would need. We have a ton of great really complicated questions in the chat uh, and the Q&A. So, um, but I know we also are running up on our time here. Um, so Molly, I just wanted to see if you wanted to offer any last words um, before I wrap up. And I will say to those folks who have asked really great questions that we weren't able to get to, um, definitely reach out to me and I can help connect you with any of our panelists for some of those more technical, more in-depth um, uh, questions. This is a huge topic and we're trying to squeeze it into 45 minutes here. Uh, so um, we've done the best we can. So Molly, I don't know if you had any last words that you wanted to add before I wrap it up. Yeah, I want definitely want to thank all of our panelists. You're all experts uh, in the work that you do and we couldn't have done this webinar without you. So really appreciate your contributions. Um, and, you know, I would say that one of the big takeaways is that this is a really challenging problem to solve, but there are people with a lot of good ideas on how to make more progress faster. And so that gives me hope that even though this is complicated and challenging and can take a long time, that if we work together with a whole lot more money and also a whole lot more information that we can make real progress. Thanks, Molly. And again, I echo that. Big thanks, um, Todd, Jamie, Aviva, and Tom for this conversation and sharing all your knowledge with us today. Um, for those of you uh, who are attending, thanks so much for taking your time. Um, if you do want to write your members of Congress about uh, the Alliance's federal priorities, uh, including all of this stuff that we just talked about with agriculture, you can visit our website um, and our action center, which is greatlakes.org slash take action. Um, and it makes it super easy to send a letter to your representatives and senators. And you'll certainly be hearing a lot more from us on these issues. So again, big thank you to our panelists and thank you so much to everybody who joined us today. Have a good one.